My farm has been in the family since the late 1870s, and now we farm about 800 acres uh, with my brothers. It was a dairy farm up until about 10 years ago when we made the decision to uh, lighten our load a little bit, so we segued into raising Holstein steers, and then we segued out of that in about two years ago. Um, so now we raise crops, mostly alfalfa, soybeans, corn, and a little bit of oats. My grandpa was uh, a fairly active conservationist way back. We have some of the oldest terraces in Wisconsin. They were built with WPA money during the Depression. Um, but contour farming was always something we did here. We understand very clearly that the soil is what gives us an opportunity to have a career. We've been entirely no-till for the last 25 years. No-till has been um, just one of the, the basic greatest decisions we've ever made in terms of our operation. It's just been the perfect fit for us on our rolling acres here. I had done some research with Greg Olson on a different part of our farm, and he just brought up the idea of trying something new out here, and I'm always open to new ideas, and it sounded intriguing. So we started out with three prairie strips four years ago. Um, they turned out really well. I like them for a number of reasons, and uh, we added a fourth one two years ago. But they fit into our operation. They fit into our philosophy. They look nice, and they obviously do a job for us. They're all placed on slopes where we had issues with water flowing, and, and they're, they're doing their job. In general, based on some information that came out of Iowa State University, it, they, they talk about doing 10% of a field in prairie strips can get you up to 90% reduction in phosphorus loss. This farm has contours on it, so the, the, it, it was kind of an interesting concept for, for building this. Uh, a contour field is much smaller than your standard field because each individual contour is a field, right? So instead, we moved into a concept of let's look at 10% of the hillside, not the individual field. And then we moved into actually looking at how does it fit the operation. So on the two lower strips on the hillside we're on right now, we actually went into moving on the contour because that's the way they work this field. The field behind us actually has a strip that it's a rectangular field and even though the contour is different it was ran as a rectangle so that it made it easier for them to work around and its design in width is actually a little bit bigger than these because Dan wanted to make it so it fit sprayer widths. There's no wasted uh, efficiency there in terms of making it fit our equipment so we have one that literally bisects that field by having two-thirds of the land above it, one-third below it, but uh, again, it doesn't impede anything we do from a farming standpoint. And I think one of the things that works here is that these are placed very strategically in terms of the whole slope of the hill. So we, we have a strip that's maybe in, intercepting the slope at about a third of its slope and then one at two-thirds of its slope. So you've got two shots at slowing the water flow down before it hits the flatter bottom land. And one of the one of the benefits of when we did what we did out here was that um, <clears throat> the area had been a soybean field, so there was no herbicide carryover. So we were able to plant oats and alfalfa around what was going to be the prairie strips. We didn't have to use any <clears throat> herbicides on their borders for the first four years now because they've been alfalfa fields. Eventually they'll rotate into cornfields, but uh, I'm pretty good at keeping my sprayer where it belongs. So I don't think we'll put them at risk in the next year or two when we rotate out, but it'll be a consideration. After we've laid out the strip, uh, as, as Dan kind of stated, you know, the, the crop planting season is a little bit prior to the actual prairie planting season. So they will end up planting their crops, you know, around the strip that we've got marked off. That area we'll go in and we'll actually make sure that it doesn't have too much duff or, or surface cover on it, raking it, you know, cleaning it up, making sure that it actually gets good seed to soil surface contact for the seeder. Then we come in and we seed, usually that's going to be late May, 
June. Early July is a little late, but we've, we've done it and it works. If you're using a planting method with a, with a drill, you're good, because that means you're actually putting it down in the soil. You're not gonna go too deep. You're gonna be less than a quarter inch deep with this seed because it doesn't like to go deep in the ground. And that's another important factor. Some folks like to pound it a little too deep and then we run into problems. If you broadcast it, you want to roll it to push it into the soil. Because if you lay it just on the soil, wind can blow this stuff away. It's very soft, fluffy seed in a lot of cases. Now, the critical aspect that actually comes out of that is the maintenance those first two years. We want to cut it, you know, get in there with a mower and actually cut the, the, the whole entire thing at 8 inches the first year, 10 inches the second year, and we're going to cut it two to three times per year. Because what we're trying to do is, is at that point, the prairie is growing down first instead of up. We're trying to get rid of all the invasives and other problem things that are going to grow with it. We're not cutting the prairie because it's growing down. Even though Greg said uh, the plants are growing down, it did kind of bother me a little. I was going out there and cutting off what would have been seed heads on the newer plants. And I was like, I'm not sure that makes much sense to me, but it did in the long term in that we got the, the weeds that we did not want to perish. Um, and the, the prairie was just fine surviving that first year without uh, maturing any seeds. We are actually causing damage to some of the earlier successional prairie plants. But again, we know that that works. And that's, you know, that's the critical factor is, is get rid of the, the weeds and allow the prairie to develop. Um, usually in year three on these things, they just pop up. Suddenly the prairie's there. Um, and Dan can attest to that. That's exactly how it also, there, it's there, you know, and that's, that's what we expect. So those first two years are critical to keep that maintenance up. We generally never use any insecticides, so that's not an issue. Uh, <clears throat> we will be careful when we use uh, our herbicide spraying on them, but I... Uh, like I say, I have to spray next to uh, neighbors' lawns, so I'm, I'm pretty good at uh, making sure that I have the drift in the right direction and, and being careful with those sorts of things. I probably spent a half an hour this year on each of these prairie strips just with a shovel, digging out a few things I didn't want in there. You'll get your random thistle and uh, a burdock, and uh, we found a few wild parsnips, but... Uh, it's, I don't want to say I'm obsessive, but I just don't like those things <clears throat> being allowed to grow the seeds. So I just spend a little time popping them out of the ground. And that's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, after year two, we stop the mowings and we go to spot control. Yeah, like, like Dan was talking about, exactly that is, is going out and removing the things we individually we don't want there anymore. We have black-eyed Susans in here. This is bergamot. There's bees on it right now. Uh, we're getting uh, the grasses to start establishing themselves, but um, the species that we want growing here are, are pretty well overtaking the strips now, and they're pretty well self-managing too. This is a good example of the undergrowth here. Uh, there's you know, layers of canopy in this whole thing. There's a lot of uh, grasses that are uh, really just coming into their own this year, and they, they do start out under a canopy of other things. So that's kind of the fun of watching this evolve, just how the competition and the, the timing of all of it comes together. You'll see monarchs in here, you'll see cabbage butterflies, native bees, bumblebees, honeybees, a number of smaller insects that uh, I can't name, but we had an entomologist out here a couple of years ago looking and, and she was just beside herself with all the species she was seeing in here. Uh, it's pretty easy to see. If you walk right in there, the, the amount of insects is just phenomenal. Uh, they find this... Uh, just uh, kind of an oasis, and even uh, things like pheasants and such are finding this to be a um, good habitat for them too. As we all know, with uh, the way farming is done now, fence rows are getting pulled out. There just isn't that much natural habitat anymore. 
And as a beekeeper, I understand that uh, the lushness that the bees used to have 40 years ago when there were pastures and sweet clover and white clover by the acre. And in fact, people farmed sweet clover, white clover, uh, you know, for the bees to pollinate. That's just not there anymore. Um, we're trying to put a little bit of that back in, uh, in this system here. And it's showing up. There's a ton of insects in there. And some of those insects are actually beneficial to our agricultural crops too. We're gonna see how that plays out when these move into corn and soybeans beside the, uh, the pollinator strips. There's some documentation that uh, with a soybean crop, honeybees can increase the yield by three to four bushels. And it wouldn't be just honeybees that do that. These pollinators would do the same thing. So it may be in our, as a farmer's best interest to have more of those pollinators around too. I've never heard a negative comment about them at all, except for the first year when they were like, did your planter miss a spot? You know, when they were still brown and everything else was greening up about them, but uh, uh, came pretty clear pretty soon in the second year that uh, we had something going on here that was planned and not a, you know, a planting mistake. They've been ideal. Uh, we. Uh, Agreed to hold these for five years, but I can pretty much guarantee you they will never leave the farm. They seem to have a very good evolutionary progression so that uh, as they mature, there'll be different species in here more than there are now, and that's fine. We'll have to, that's part of the interest I have in them is just seeing how they do evolve over the years. So it's been kind of a fun experiment for us.